Well, this morning we're going to be talking about uh, John 10 uh, from a prophetic side. I spoke on it a little bit at um, TBO last night. But part of what the Lord's wanting me uh, to bring forth for prayer, uh, we'll be seeing here in this chapter. So I'm going to go ahead and start reading. I'm reading the Amplified, John 10. I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, he who does not enter by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way elsewhere from some other quarter is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opens the door for this man, and the sheep listens to his voice and heeds it. And he calls his own sheep by name and brings or leads them out. When he has brought his own sheep outside, he walks on before them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Because they know his voice. They will never on any account follow a stranger, but will run away from him because they do not know the voice of strangers or recognize their call. Jesus used this parable or illustration with them, but they did not understand what he was talking about. That's like us sometimes, right? Yeah. So Jesus said again, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you that I myself am the door for the sheep. All others who came as such before me are thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to or obey them. They knew something was wrong. I am the door. Anyone who enters in through me will be saved. They will live. He will come in and he will go out freely and will find pasture. The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. And I came that they might have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd risks and lays down his own life for his sheep. But the hired servant, he who merely serves for wages, is neither the shepherd nor the owner of the sheep. When he sees the wolf coming, deserts the flock and runs away, and the wolf chases and snatches them and scatters the flock. Now the hireling flees because he merely serves for wages, is not himself concerned about the sheep, cares nothing for them. But I am the good shepherd, and I know and recognize my own and, and own, know and recognize me. And so I'll go on in here in a little bit and read some more because a lot of times we'll pull the scripture out. Like, for instance, the, the thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. We'll pull that out. But there's a concept that that's tucked into. You can pull it out, but it is tucked into the paragraph that's talking about how would you get into the sheepfold to begin with. And we talked about that at TBO last night, making sure that people knew that they actually went through a door to be a part of the sheepfold because many people across this land attend church. They bury, they marry there, and they think, well, you know, I'll just try to live a good life, and, I, and I'll probably make it to heaven, I hope. But we find that they never entered the door, Right? You, they jumped the fence. Somebody threw them across. Some way, they felt like they were in there. And the sanctification process happens once you're in through that gate, through that door. And Jesus is the door. So that's kind of what we went after last night, making sure that people knew the exact day. Like, I know it uh, was New Year's Eve, 1981, when I gave my life to Christ. Someone said, there's the door. And I was like, oh, that's what I've been looking for. I've been hitting my head against all kinds of walls and going in wrong doors thinking I'm trying to get somewhere. And when I found the door, it was like, yes, and came into the sheepfold. And I know that I know that I know. No matter if I have poor behaviors, no matter if I have poor thoughts, I am a human being who's been touched by sin. So, yes, sins, sins are forgiven. Um, glory to God. But I'm not a perfect person. I'm not a perfect sheep, but I'm in the fold. Amen. Right? Yeah. And hopefully all here are the same and those watching so there is a door there's no name written among men under heaven whereby we must be saved but the name of jesus jesus is the way the truth the life no man comes unto the father except through him and so that's that's the first base of what we're talking about but prophetically what i want to talk about here in prayer because we're taking this chapter like a conversation so i'm not just going to come along and pull out a section without hearing this is what he's been talking about the whole time and so he's saying he's the good shepherd. And so he role models um, the, the shepherd and saying this is how the shepherd will ask. I mean, or, or act. The shepherd will lay down their life for the sheep. Yeah. Right? It's, it's like, no, I'm, I'm going to take care of this. I'll go after the wolf. I'll do these different things. And um, the hired servant, though, he who merely serves for wages, verse 12, 
who is neither the shepherd nor the owner of the sheep, when he sees the wolf coming, deserts the flocks and runs away. And the wolf chases and snatches them and scatters the flock. Now the hireling flees because he merely serves for wages and is not himself concerned about the sheep or cares nothing for them. But Jesus is the good shepherd. And so this is what I see happen. This is what I prophesied last night. I want to bring it up again this morning that in the next six months, this great shaking that's going on with the body of Christ because the shaking is not like, oh, this just this world system. I mean, sin has been here this whole time. It's just light. The outpouring of the spirit is coming. And so it's just like I said, you turn on a light in a room, the rats scatter. They were there the whole time, but you couldn't see them because it was dark. So when the light comes on, things scatter. Be sure your sins will find you out. Things will come into the light. They will be revealed. So there's revelation right now happening all across our world because there's an outpouring of the Spirit. I mean, just because we haven't seen tons of revival here, that's does. I mean, we're behind. America is behind. We're taking our time. We're like they say, lollygagging, you know, and um, because, you know, we're comfortable. We've been comfortable. But you go other places, you know, Ecuador and Nicaragua, all these different places. I mean, you're seeing Cuba, huge revival is taking place, right? And so, um, but, you know, they've gone without. They're, they're, they're not blocked by all um, the riches. And so their hearts are like, we just need God. We need God, and, and there's an outpouring. So that outpouring is exactly what Reinhard Bunke um, felt the Lord told him. Of course, he started in Africa. If you draw the big picture, right, wisdom always goes what was, what is, and where are we going. And so if you look at what was, he was pulled out of uh, a life of war and all kinds of things as a kid and stationed in Africa. His family was against him. All kinds of people were like, you're crazy. You're going to Africa. And he kept saying, Africa will be saved. Right? And so huge revival. Millions of people would come out to his crusades. And then it was not that long back, probably in a 10-year period of time here. I wouldn't know the date that he got up and prophesied here in the United States. The Lord is telling me, to get to the United States because if it's lost, the world will be lost, right? And so he turned his vision toward the United States and went after Canada because that's where some revival things had, had started um, and Youth with a Mission and all these different ones that um, he was a part of. And then you have, I um, can't think of his name right now, who is his predecessor. He just took over, uh, Kalenda, Daniel Kalenda, right? Um, now he's got Daniel Kalenda because, of course, um, Reinhardt's gone on to be with the Lord last year. And so um, that was a deposit as his life laid down. There was a deposit of anointing that ricocheted here in the United States. He had been building it in the spirit all this time, and the Lord told him to unleash it in the United States. He passes, he gives that ministry on, and um, they're seeing people saved by the droves. I mean, it is, it's, it's going to sweep America. So I'm drawing the bigger picture to say it's not just coming through one organization, but I'm drawing the big picture to, to say there's a pressure of light. Like, because you can't turn on the news and, and see that light, all you see is the dark stuff that's going on. Um, you're like, oh, when is revival going to come? When is this happening? There's a pressure of light that's already here. People are getting saved uh, uh, through Calvin Wood's ministry and other ministries right down where George uh, Floyd got killed, right? There's going to be a busting out, like he says, um, that's going to happen. That's um, revival. So there's a light that's hitting the darkness, and what that light is doing is it's going to reflect on the church because the church, the body of Christ, you know, all different denominations, wherever we are sitting comfortable, um, there's darkness mm -hmm. because faith is always on the move, right? So when we get just to that spot, like, well, we're not, we're just maintaining ground, we're not, oh, demons move in on that. And the spirit of religion moves in on that. And it sits and it looks, has a form of godliness, but denies the power thereof. That's the end times church, right? That's what he said is going to go on in the end times church. We're going to say there, there's a form of godliness, but we deny the power thereof. Well, the shaking is not for the people riding. It's not for all this, this stuff that's going on. It's for the church. The shaking that's going on is wake up. 
the giant needs to arise, right? And, um, and when the giant gets up, like Oral Roberts saw in, in a vision many years ago, as it's sitting up, demons are jumping ship, right? And so there's going to be a great deliverance. Part of that great deliverance is in this scripture where we, it, it's going to differentiate who's the good shepherd and who are the shepherds following the good shepherd. Because if I'm following Christ and he'd lay down his life for us, and he did, right, then I have to have the same attitude in this end day Amen. to lay down my life for the gospel, for the sheep, for the sake of the cause, for the call, for the martyrdom that needs to take place, for, for to be seen and heard at all costs. So, but the hired servant, he who merely, merely serves for wages, who is neither the shepherd nor the owner of the sheep, when he sees the wolf coming, deserts the flock and runs away, and the wolf chases and snatches them and scatters the flock. That great shaking of what's going on, you're going to see churches scatter right? And the great shaking that's going to, to go on. Also, you're going to see uh, leadership clearly stand out, especially in the next six months. The Lord told me in the next six months, um, you're going to see leadership clearly stand out as um, it's like, whoa, I didn't know they were a hireling, but they're definitely taking the hireling's attitude where leadership will just back off and like be more concerned about the things that we should fear than they are the sheep and more concerned about their paycheck than they are the sheep. That has to sort out for this end time revival. Right now, think about it, why? I mean, it's just good business on top of it. It's a sorting of the hearts, but it's good business for this, this reason. If I was going to open a daycare, I would have to know, you know, the babies are coming in, I would have to know who's qualified to work with me. Right. And so if this is going to be the greatest, which it is, end times harvest that we have ever seen in the history of mankind. Right. That's what's coming. That's what's happening. It's culminating that out of his spirit. He's pouring out on all flesh right now. People are dreaming dreams and there's a there's an awakening that's taking place. This outpouring is taking place and we look for the positive. We look for the outpouring first to do this. We're like, and then people were laying down on the floor and this one had a demon come out. And woo, that's the outpouring. That's a revival service. The outpouring checks your heart first. Think about that. I'll let that sit a little bit. The outpouring of the Spirit checks your heart first, the very intent of your heart, why you do what you do, what you say, why are you saying it, what's your attitude? Proverbs says that the Lord knows even the intent of our heart. And so in full gospel circles, we weigh revival stuff on, on you know, how many people went down, you know, when we had a prayer line, how many people ca gathered for the event, right? And, and then we'll call that a revival. That's not revival. That was an outpouring for a service, and then it's over. Right? The outpouring of his light is the blessing that drives out the curse, which comes by light, overtakes the darkness, and divides things. It'll divide your heart, your soul. It'll divide out, right? The bone and the marrow, the wrong from the right. And we've been going through that as a church in a, you know, if, if, Individually, you might not see it when you're here, but if I talk to each of you individually, I know for a fact everybody's going through like a, oh, I just got divided out on some things. I really had to choose some things. This fall, when it comes time to go back to school, you know, people are like, oh, it's calming down right now. It's calming down. We'll probably be able to send the kids to school or whatever. Oh, the devil already has a plan. If he brings us back around again, like there's another wave, right? Are you willing to send your kids to school, your grandkids to school, so they can constantly be brainwashed to stay apart from people? Don't touch. Stay in the same spot. Wear the mask. Do the thing. Obey. It isn't about the sickness anymore, right? I don't know that it ever was. And so, um, so that's going to be, just pose that question. That's an outpouring that the, the demonic realm said, here's a great idea, right? And had a standard. And God's then saying to the church, raise up another standard. 
let me raise up another standard higher than this baloney. And who's going to be a part? Who choose you this day who you're going to serve, right? Who will follow is what the Lord of the harvest is saying right now. Who will follow? And for those who uh, the hireling flees because merely serves for wages is not himself concerned about the sheep. Sometimes the wage is glory. It isn't about, you know, maybe you don't have a paid position. People across America might be in churches. They don't have a paid position, but they're the choir director and they've always been the choir director and that's their spot of glory, right? But when things go awry, are they going to be about the sheep or their spot? That's going to divide out. Because the harvest that is coming is newborn babies. And the Lord of the harvest loves us all. But he is going to be gentle and caring through his people to those people coming in. Amen. Right? And so the heart's got to divide now. Quickly, quickly, quickly. So there's a pressure. There's a heat that is on. And it's going to divide it out. You will see people back out of the ministry in the next six months. Because there's a heat of evil and mandates of rules and things like that. Well, I guess it's just getting too, I mean, this world's gone crazy. That's usually statements we make that kind of are, um, let's get this off of me. I'm not responsible for anything. It's the world that's just gone crazy. We'll do something about it. That might actually require something of us. So here's the thing. He describes in the beginning part of the chapter that he is the door. And anyone who enters through me, he will be saved, right? Well, it talks about also the, uh, the watchman is the one who shows the door. The Holy Spirit is the watchman, but the Holy Spirit dwells in you. So together, we're the ones saying, there's the door. There's the door. Get to safety. Be saved. Go through the door. Right? And then he's the good shepherd. Well, then when we're in that sheepfold, then we get to know the shepherd who would lay down and has laid down his life for the sheep. Then the under shepherds, the watchmen, the leaders, the people themselves take the same attitude, right? Because he said, uh, wherever he goes, his sheep follow because we know his voice. We know his character. We know how he acts. We know what he'd like of us. And we're becoming Christ in us is that hope of glory. Right? right? So we're going to emulate that same thing in these last days that no matter what, we're going to be seen and heard at all costs. And we are about the sheep. And the sheep begat sheep. Yes. Yeah? It's the last days, and it's a begotten time where, like, we have got to be in that position that we know how to take care of the sheep that are coming, be praying for the sheep that are coming, positioning them. It's never going to go. I want you to hear this also online and hear and cross these airwaves. The church will never go back into a sleeping position. In this hour, it's choose you this day whom you're going to serve. We're going to be alive and on the move or dead. So it's going to knock out the pretenders. The pretenders, the, the um, you know, you, you play the part, right? And a lot of it's for attention. It's for wages. It's something to do. It's for glory. It's for all that's going to get sorted out. Um, you know, wages is not something that counts you know, it's nice to make a living. Bern and I know what it's like to go years without wages, but you're still about the sheep. You're still about the sheep. And in the end, if something would happen, they took our building, they took whatever. We still need to be about the sheep. It isn't like Vern and I would be like, oh, that's too bad. Our church is gone now. And we just would be done. We are going to stand before God as shepherds, under shepherds, saying, did we shepherd like the great shepherd did? Right? But here's the, here's the thing. You don't always stay a lamb. You grow. You grow, and then the job is to begat sheep. And sheep are protective of their young ones. And so that's the attitude of the church. That's the shift in the church. Now, the hireling flees because he merely serves for wages. He's not himself concerned about the sheep. He cares nothing for them. 
religion is going to hang itself out right now. You're going to see a clear divider of who is really about the sheep. And it's not like just a scary thing, you know, like, oh, I don't like it or whatever. It has to happen. It's a strainer. It's being thrown in the air, right? And having the chaff separated away. He's doing it with us all. Not just pastors, not just leaders. He's doing it with us all. But as much as he's doing it with you, oh my goodness, the leaders, the pastors, the teachers, the heads are going to be more accountable than ever before. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. So far before, it was a month and a half before uh, this corona baloney um, started. <clears throat> and that's when I was between asleep and awake. And the Lord said, position yourself as a martyr. That'll wake you up right now. You're like, what? So what? Are you, what? <laughs> First thing I saw is people's heads coming off. It's like, okay. Um, you know, but the word martyr comes from the word witness. And the word witness means to be seen and heard at all costs, even unto the point of death. You only do that if you're about the sheep. You can only be a witness if you're about the sheep. That's scary. A lot of people say, that's really scary. And I've even had some people, when I've shared that, say, Pastor Mary, you're so brave. Uh, I'm a No, what? The only way you can actually be a true martyr or witness to be seen and heard at all costs is by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's who's brave, right? We're just vessels. Like, sure, use this temple. Because this temple on its own ain't so brave. <laughs> not so courageous, not so whatever. Um, but you get the outpouring of the Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit moving. This is why probably in the last 20 years especially, there has been such a fight in the entire body of Christ. I'm talking all denominations regarding speaking in tongues. Because, I mean, the devil does not want that being unleashed. That's the last day's power. Because he pours out of his spirit on all flesh. People are going to get baptized in the Holy Ghost. And there's going to be power coming out like crazy to do signs and wonders and to be my witnesses here up close, here in the middle, and there to the ends of the earth. That's what he declared over us. When you receive the Holy Spirit, that's how it's going to go down. So we talked about this, and churches have even said this scripture. Some have said this scripture when it comes to Acts chapter 1 and 2. Um, but then the actual doing of it has come up short. Like, yes, we just know we're just going to be his witnesses. And we'll just keep repeating these phrases. And the doing part has come up short. Really, if we measure our life like, are we doing, are we going? It's short. And so the change that's going to come is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is going to be to get the power to flow through us. But the power flows through us the most and the best when we're about the sheep. Amen. Yeah. Establishing his kingdom. It isn't so I can say I have a gift or I operate in some, you know, ooh, I, I do something, you know, good. That's great. But are you about the sheep? Would you lay down your life for the sheep? your daily walk for the sheep, your time off for the sheep. Um, you know, th there's a time that uh, the Lord will ask and require a pastor and I and, and to go beyond even principles that we've laid down, like we've got to have a day off. That's what's right. That's how you balance things, blah, blah. There's seasons, though, that he'll just say go. And then there is no day off for weeks, right? We just came through that. Pretty much, we call it a sort of day off. Like, are we going to sort of have a day off today? So we'll have some, we'll go out to eat or we'll do something and then do something else. And I'm not saying that to say everybody needs to do that. But if you pay attention and you're about the sheep, about end times revival, about what's going on out there, he'll require something of you and then you go. And you can't hold the old protocol. You can't take to that and say, you know, but this is my life. Oh, actually, you died. You lay down your life. And hirelings, I will tell you, they're there for the wage and they want to know the contract. Right? right. Exactly. They, want, they want to know they're going to look. So, so how many hours do I have to? Is that what, what are you asking of me? Yeah. Yeah. That's a hireling. 
And so when things go awry, the hireling will run and leave the sheep hang because it's a wrong attitude. So we're going to agree in pr prayer this morning for all the leadership here in the state of Minnesota. We're going to deal with our region. Um, and I just pray that, you know, that for America too, but we're going to pray for our region and for the leadership because most people I almost feel sad for them. Don't know it's here. Most pastors, most leaders, most bishops, most, uh, they don't even know. Like they, if they're there as a hireling, especially, they have no idea the outpouring of the spirits about to rock their world. And you, if you go with it, everything changes. If you go against it, everything changes. I'd rather go with him and find out his blessing than to go the opposite way. So let's stand. I am the good shepherd and I know and recognize my own and, I, and my own know and recognize me. How do we know this? My sheep know my voice according to uh, verse 4. Even as truly as the Father knows me and I also, this verse 15, know the Father and I am giving my very own life and laying it down on behalf of the sheep. I have other sheep besides these that are not of this fold. I must bring and impel those also and they will listen to my voice. See, it comes back down to he's said it repeatedly in this chapter it's about his voice who conveys his voice to us in this hour the holy spirit right so never before i mean if this is going to be the biggest revival then the holy spirit gets to have the voice the most and so my voice and heed my call, so there will be, they will become one flock under one shepherd. One flock under one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I laid down my own life to take it back again. No one takes it away from me. On the contrary, I laid down and voluntarily I put it for myself. See, these are red letters. So Jesus is talking to us this morning. I am authorized and have power to lay it down, to resign it. And I am authorized and have power to take it back again. These are the instruction orders, which I have received as my charge from the father. Jesus did this for us. Then a fresh division of opinion arose among the Jews because of his saying these things. And many of them said, he is a demon and he's mad. Well, that's what they're going to say of us when we make choices to do the things of the Father. Insane, he raves, he rambles. Why do you listen to him? Others argued, these are not the thoughts and the language of, of one possessed. Can a demon possessed person open blind eyes? After the feast of the dedication of the reconsecration of the temple was taking place at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in Solomon's porch in the temple area. So the Jews surrounded him and began to ask him, how long are you going to keep us in doubt and suspense? If you really the Christ, the Messiah, tell us plainly and openly. In some ways, that's the question of the world right now. Looking at the church, is your God real? How long are you going to keep us in suspense? I mean, Tell me what's really going on. Jesus answered them, and I have told you so, yet you do not believe me. You do not trust me and rely on me. The very works that I do by the Father, or by the power of my Father, and in my Father's name bear witness concerning me, that are my credentials. They're my credentials and evidence in support of me. But you do not believe and trust, and so there will be people who will be in that spot and rely on me because you do not belong to my fold. There's something about being in the sheepfold. You are no sheep of mine. The sheep that are my own hear and listen to my voice. This chapter, he said that four or five times. They know my voice. They heed my voice. They follow my voice. It's my voice. Holy Spirit, yeah. come. Outpour upon your church, upon the leadership of churches throughout this land with your spirit and open, unclog the ears, Lord God. We repent for religiosity on their behalf and our behalf. We repent so that there's a digging out of their ears like you talk about in the Old Testament. Lord, that you dig out the ears of all the leadership, that they can have that awakening that says, aha, I hear your voice by the the spirit of the living God. We follow you because of your voice. We know you because of your voice. We heed to you because of your voice. Holy Spirit, come. Praise you, Lord Jesus. 
Praise you, praise you, praise you. Lord, I thank you that you're dividing out our hearts. We welcome it. We will welcome it, Lord, that there is a clearness here that says, this is not of me and this is of me. And you just mark it right down the middle. There'll be such a great divide that we will not be deceived. No, not one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One of the characteristics of a hireling, and I, you don't have to be a pastor to be a hireling. You can just be in a, in a, in a servanthood attitude and, and be in that spot where like, well, I want to be paid. I want to get this or whatever. It's selfishness. So selfishness is what causes the hireling attitude. And in fact, if you hire a pastor and, and the congregation hires a leader in a hireling's attitude, it's like, I own you. Yeah. Now you've taken the spot of the great shepherd. Yeah. I own you because we pay your paycheck. Yeah. All right? That's why I've always said, I ain't nobody's hireling. Then don't pay me, but I still will go on and feed the sheep. Right? So there's an attitude. There's an attitude. So, so there's something about selfishness that is going, it's going to hit us at the core. It's going to require of our time. He's been saying it for years. Require of our time, our energy, our love, our affection, our finances. It's going to require the all of us to lay down our life for the people around us. And selfishness in fear will drive us to the point where we'll say, let's just stay at home. COVID's going on. We can't, we can't go out and help. We can't do anything. Let's just. Now, some people are staying at home because they need to, right? But even when you're at home, you can find ways to reach out to people. People still write letters and cards and use the phone. So, Father, we thank you that you are shaking the selfishness off of word of life off of TBO, out of our own personal hearts, out of our family. Get off of us. We renounce you. Oh, self-ish. Lord God, we just, we renounce that part that has set up through religion, that it's set up through the hirelings attitude. We renounce it. Get off of us. We rebuke it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We resist it. We do not permit it. We are a last days church. We are a regional center that will be seen and heard at all costs. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, my sheep know my voice. My voice and they heed my call. My sheep know my voice. We believe and know his voice. Hallelujah. I'm just going to throw it out here too, to truly, like we break the selfishness off and we, we're addressing that because that's part of that hireling you know, you give me something and then maybe I'll help. You know, what's in it for me kind of thing. That's not how Jesus laid down his life for other people. We have some situations right now that you come talk to me. If you want to help and lay down your life to help in those situations, we need help. And it might be physical things that need to be done. But those physical things are setting up to help people. So be sure to come and talk to me because if you're like, well, I don't know what to do. I got jobs. I got things. There are some things that are just physical things that are in the way of helping people. They just need to get done. They need to get done. And so I, I just implore you to go before the Lord and ask if in any area, Lord, show me if I have a hireling's heart. Show me if I have a hireling's attitude in any area. I'll come to church if you bless me. I'll come to church if you show yourself to me rather than we go to church to give. And in that giving, we will receive a harvest. Let's have the band come. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. You're so good. You are so good. 
we just love you. We love what you're doing. You're, you're so wise. You're the Lord of the harvest. You know what you're doing. You're the great harvester. Yeah. It's your fields, and they're white. They're white for the harvest. They're ripe for the harvest. And, Lord, we come with our sickles willing to serve. And we don't worry about whether or not we're getting paid. We come with our sickles willing to serve, and we just know that we're blessed and highly favored, and all that will get taken care of. I don't even have to worry about it. We're harvesters. I call that over, word of life, all the way down through the out outreaches. Lord, we're harvesters with harvester attitudes in the mighty name of Jesus. And we come before you right now um, in worship. We want to lift you up that you draw the beacon of this light here. will be just shine out through our region, and you'll draw people so that we can partake in this great harvest. Lord Jesus, thank you. Amen.